Hello, everybody, and welcome to the keynote address for the Common Cause 2020 conference. I'm David Velker, Professor of Humanities and History at UW-Green Bay, and I'm the co-chair of Common Cause 2020, which includes both this conference this week and a virtual speaker series all year long. If you're curious or unsure, CAUSE stands for the College of Arts, Humanities, and Social Sciences, which is the sponsor of this event. I'd like to begin this evening by reading the UWGB land acknowledgement. And I think it's especially important that we recognize First Nations for these events, given that we are addressing the relationship between humans and the larger community of life, uh, which First Nations have a very uh, powerful perspective on. And also given that we're talking about environmental and social justice issues throughout this series. Uh, if you caught my opening plenary address on Monday, which is now available on YouTube, you'll know that, that First Nations perspectives informed and really inspired my talk. Just one second here, I have one more slide to share. For the land acknowledgement. <clears throat> we at the University of Wisconsin Green Bay acknowledge the First Nations people who are the, are the original inhabitants of the region. The Ho-Chunk Nation and the Menominee Nation are the original first people of Wisconsin and both nations have ancient historical and spiritual connections to the land that our institution now resides upon. Today, Wisconsin is home to 12 First Nations communities, including the Oneida Nation of Wisconsin, Forest County Potawatomi, Ojibwe Nation communities, Stockbridge Muncie Band of the Mohicans, and the Brotherton Indian Nation. We acknowledge the First Nations people of Wisconsin. This year, the theme for Common Cause is Beyond Sustainability, Imagining an Ecological Future. Um, this theme is an invitation to think about how we might benefit from a more robust framework than environmental sustainability to address the interrelated environmental and social crises that we now face. Uh, we've been continuing in our deeply unsustainable ways for many decades, even as we've been talking a lot about sustainability. Um, so drawing on the arts, humanities, and social sciences, uh, we're hoping to really imagine alternative futures uh, to have a vision that can get us really beyond this idea that we might sustain a status quo that is deeply unsustainable. Um, and uh, the keynote tonight helps us really think about many of uh, the challenges of really coming to terms with our situation, especially in regard to climate change. Um, before I introduce our speaker, I want to thank CAUSE Associate Dean Ryan Martin, who's the co-chair of Common Cause, Amanda Weldenberg, assistant to the Dean, who's helping run um, our event this evening, the Common Cause Planning Committee and Dean Chuck Ryback for his support of the conference and of the speaker series. Professor Ray will speak for about 30 minutes. While she's talking, you can use the Q&A to submit questions and comments, and I will moderate those questions after the talk. It's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Sarah Jaquette Ray, who is the program leader of the Environmental Studies Program at Humboldt State University. I think you can see the, the banner there behind her. Um, she received her PhD in Environmental Sciences Studies and Policy with a focal department of English at the University of Oregon. She holds a bachelor's degree in Religious Studies from Swarthmore College and a master's degree in American Studies from U University of Texas, Austin. Her first book is called The Ecological Other environmental exclusion in American culture, and it explores the ways that environmental discourse often reinforces existing social hierarchies, drawing on a legacy of nativist, racial, and ableist exclusion in environmental history. Um, Dr. Ray has also co-edited three collections. Uh, she's here this evening to talk about a book that just came out this year, Maybe you're going to hold that up. <laughs> yeah. A field guide to climate anxiety, how to keep your cool on a warming planet. 
Uh, I found out about this book because I read one of her articles and became very excited about the holistic and interdisciplinary approach um, that she took to confronting environmental problems. And I think that approach certainly carried over to this book. Uh, Professor Ray's title for this evening is Coming of Age at the End of the World, an Existential Toolkit for the Climate and COVID Generation. Thanks so much for sharing with us uh, this evening, Professor Ray. Thank you very much. I really appreciate that, David Volker. And I wanted to thank, I'm turning on my timer here, so give me one second, make sure I can talk within my time. Um, I want to thank David Volker and University of Wisconsin Green Bay for inviting me for the keynote for this important event. And I hope you're all having uh, be able to attend a lot of different things. And if you couldn't see before, I just was pointing out my banner. That's where I'm where I am. I'm I'm on Weot Land, which is in um, which is also known as Arcata, California. And um, I really wanted to extend my appreciation for the land acknowledgement that David opened with. Um, and talk a little bit about what, what that means to me to hear that. And of course, um, I do that in many of my talks as well. The, um, the sort of point about the land acknowledgement, of course, is though that it asks us to commit to doing something in our lives. And so I wanted to explain that um, while I acknowledge that I am on WIAT territory and I appreciate your land acknowledgement, I also want to explain to you all what that commits me to actually doing. Um, I have become much more committed to understanding decolonization in my own research and my teaching and all the work I do in and outside of my professional life. I try to ensure that I'm teaching about colonization as the origin of our current experience of climate disruption, which is often counter to the origin story of our problem being in industrialization or in capitalism. So this is often an unpopular argument about what the root cause of the climate crisis that we're in is. I seek to stand with tribal sovereignty efforts when the climate movement in all of its urgency and techno optimism sometimes works against indigenous interests. And so sometimes the climate movement and indigenous movements are at odds with one another. And I think that's very important to, for us to acknowledge because I think more often we hear that um, indigenous, you know, traditional ecological knowledge is one solution to the climate problem and that climate folks ought to be looking to indigenous ways to build resilience and to think about survivance. And I think that's all very fine and well. And I, of course, try to do that in a sensitive way in my book. But I think even more important is to acknowledge the ways that these two movements often work against each other and the potential hypocrisies therein of a climate movement that wants on the one hand to think about indigenous resilience strategies, but on the other hand, oftentimes um, runs right over indigenous sovereignty when thinking about solutions to climate crisis. So one of the threads in my book, A Field Guide to Climate Anxiety, the, um, the one that, <laughs> that David mentioned that I was gonna hold up, but um, nobody saw, so I'm holding this up, this is my book. Um, is to resist the white supremacist aspects of the climate movement and to lift up the ways that social justice movements, especially through youth, is something I really want to point out, um, are calling on the climate movement to change. Um, and they're holding mainstream environmentalism accountable for its racist legacies. Another aspect of anti-racism that I grapple with in the book is attending to how climate anxiety is experienced differently depending on a person's positionality, their race, their gender, their geography, class, etc. And how forms of intergenerational and racial trauma must be center to all the conversations that we're having about emotions and how emotions shape effective action for climate justice. And so it's tempting to have the most dominant student in the classroom um, reflect back to me what the emotional arc or the, the affective arc of a student's experience in a classroom is around environmental injustice and climate disruption. But um, I've been thinking a lot recently about how um, as our students are increasingly in California, especially, um, not not white anymore, that this is actually sort of a form of centering whiteness to expect any one particular affective arc to be true. So I'm thinking a lot about the um, different ways that people experience climate you know, anxiety. So I wanted to open, open my talk today with that, my own form of that land acknowledgement, um, which we all know is never enough just to acknowledge. And I, I wanted to um, make sure that I'm not um, making that an excuse to stop doing the work of decolonization myself. 
So thank you for that. Um, I wanted to just give you a quick outline about my half hour talk. I'm hoping it's be really in time here. Um, first, I want to talk about why I wrote this book, uh, why I think it's important to center emotions in climate justice advocacy and environmental education more broadly. And then third, I would like to just speak a little bit about the chapters in the book and give a flavor of the actual existential tools in the toolkit. And then finally, I'd like to contextualize the book in terms of our current moment of COVID and the racial reckoning that we see happening in the US and, and internationally. So I'm hoping to get to all of those things and I'll, I'll breeze through them and hopefully in the Q&A, things that I didn't pick up on will get asked. Um, I really do wanna speak a lot about what's unique about this generation and I'm hoping that that question will come up too, because um, I'm going to skip through that. So the story of why I wrote this book. My background, as um, David Volker had mentioned, is more in environmental justice and literature. And uh, I was teaching kind of an environmental humanities approach to environmental justice in all my classes, but came to find out that my students' emotional response to that was overcoming our classroom time and also my office hours and also my email inbox. And I started to feel that their existential dread and their despair and their sense of complicity and guilt in all of the problems that the world was facing and their sense of um, powerlessness to do anything about it, um, the sense of the scale being too large and them being too small, what some psychologists call the drop in the bucket imaginary, was really causing them to not even be able to come to class, much less turn into the kinds of environmental stewards and leaders and citizens that we in our brochures and our materials were purporting to be training in our degrees. And so I realized that as much as the content that they were learning in classes was very important, that my teaching role really needed to shift to thinking about affective outcomes. So the question became no longer just what kinds of information do they need to know to be great problem solvers out in the world, but what kinds of emotional tools do they need to be able to finish college and get out there and do this work and then sustain it for their careers. And so that became a really different type of question and a different sense of my role as a researcher and as a teacher. Um, and I also found that um, arming students with a lot of really strong arguments about environmental justice was in fact undermining them in some ways. For one, they were starting to see that they and they themselves were complicit in a lot of forms of environmental injustice, that there were sort of white supremacist forms of environmental behavior that they might be participating in, that the connections between environmental problems and social justice problems were so entrenched um, that they started to feel um, sort of despair around the content. And their relationship started to fray with their family and their communities. They would go home during holidays, have huge fights with Uncle Bob or whoever over you know, Thanksgiving or, or the holiday winter break. And I used to ignore that as kind of collateral damage for their education. But I didn't really realize that in fact, the lab for what we need coming up and what we need right now was in fact these relationships being maintained. And this is something I'll get into more in my talk and it was a real wake up call for me. I also had my own personal burnout and reckoning with um, denial around the, the significance of the problem of climate change that my students were really holding me accountable to. Um, so one of the things that um, I, I talk about and more in the book is the sort of mental health backdrop of young people as a context for which this is all happening. And I hope that maybe we can talk about that more in the Q&A, but the mental health um, kind of picture of what college students or what I call the climate generation are going through and are experiencing is, is unique. Um, and it, it created a situation where I thought, well, if, I can, if, I'm not, if I'm going to be an effective educator, I'm gonna really need to take quite seriously what's happening with my students emotionally. Um, finally, the 2016 US presidential election was a real kind of watershed moment for me in thinking about what the role of the humanities could possibly be in fixing the problems that we see in the world. And I really felt quite a lot of despair and powerlessness around that. Um, and my answer to that was to, to think about becoming, to try to make my work more accountable to the public so that I could really make an argument for in the, in the things I produced that the humanities are very important for uh, engaging in the world in the ways that are, are needed um, and we're called to do. So what could higher education offer, but more specifically, what do the humanities offer? And what can I do in my role as a professor and a writer and a teacher to try to fix these problems? And I really um, came to thinking about writing a public facing book that's actually written for young people. So it's accessible and it doesn't have footnotes and it's 
not laden with jargon. Um, and I was very, I'm very grateful to the press that I worked with, the University of California Press and the editors there to um, un helping me unlearn all of the kind of weird um, jargon and habits of a, scholar, of a scholar that I had been learning up until this point of writing this book. So the journey of actually producing a book like that was really quite interesting in and of itself and also attests to how important I think it is that humanistic scholars um, really do make their work, make the case for their work for a public um, audience, especially the students that we teach. Um, okay, so the second, the second topic I want to talk about is why, why should we center emotion in thinking about all these crises? And one of the um, reasons that we need to do this, I lay out in the book, is that an intelligence about the role of emotion in decision making will make us better at persuading others to care about what we care about. And so an example of how important emotion is into our ability to make decisions and what kinds of actions we take is something that um, I learned in the research um, around pseudo inefficacy. And the pseudo inefficacy hypothesis basically goes that they use this sort of child in the pond experiment where they had people who are walking by a child who's drowning in a pond um, are very likely to try to save that child drowning in the pond. But if there's a child drowning in the pond in front of them and they also a child drowning in a pond a little bit away, they're actually less likely to even try to um, save the child drowning in the pond right in front of them and sort of give up entirely. And this has real implications for how we perceive the, the scale of a crisis to be in terms of whether or not we will make a decision to try to act on it. And so this sort of blew my mind and really resonated with my, my, my experience with students that their sense of um, ability to and motivation to you know, get engaged and to act and to take action and to, and to feel up for the challenge that was ahead of us was really shaped by how big they thought the problem was. Another th reason why we need to take emotions seriously is because when we're triggered, when we have our, our amygdala operating, when we're fear having a, in a kind of chronic state of anxiety or stress or fear, we just, we just don't make rational decisions. And this is this sort of basic psychology that I'm sure we're all familiar with. But this really struck me as an important insight for my students and for myself that when we're in a state of anxiety or anger or fear, which are very important emotions, we are not likely to make rational decisions. And I think that the other side of the coin about that is that um, all of our decisions are, have emotional bases for that. Um, so I was really interested in the research and I draw on the book about how central emotions are to all of our decision making and that data or reason or logic is not in fact what makes people make decisions or change their behavior. This sort of goes against the grain of most of what we hear about in kind of Western, um, Western US culture which really prioritizes reason over emotion. It even genders it. Um, the thinking that the, the, just give us the facts. If we look at the way facts and science have been deployed in current political rhetoric, we see a great example of this, that facts and alternative facts and all this are really about emotion and trust and the messenger more so than they are about claims to objectivity. And I think we can see the fact that both sides of our, you know, both sides of our political, um, you know, the Republicans and the Democrats in the last campaign were using science and data and facts um, equally, right? Um, so another reason that we th should center emotions is that um, people come together and keep doing work that makes them feel good. And so this is using all kinds of neuroscience um, research to, to realize that environmental messaging that um, makes people feel guilt and deprivation and, and the need to sacrifice and this kind of um, berating about leaving no impact and even to the point of self erasure. You know, I think of my students often, I can tell by the look on their face that they've sort of already begun a campaign of self erasure before they've even read my syllabus, you know. Um, that kind of nihilism is super dangerous, a, a co cocktail on top of all the other things that are going on with young people. And I think this is a real call for the environmental movement, the climate movement, which is happening because young people are taking this on board to actually turn the climate movement into something that feels good. And that's the sort of radical um, change, right? That th there's a certain level of joy and play and desire and pleasure, that those are sort of operating emotional principles by which we ought to be um, kind of hanging our decisions and, and thinking about engaging other people. Another reason to center emotion is that there is an emotional roller coaster with climate anyway. And to know what's happening emotionally will help us um, deal with those emotions better. So an example of this is the negativity bias in both news and social media and in our own brains and our own kind of um, neurological makeup. 
Um, we tend to uh, seek out, our brains tend to seek out negative news, and this is something that psychologists have shown. And also because of that and relatedly, news media and social media will focus mostly on negative news. And so something about, something like 85% of climate stories in the news media are in the negative frame, i.e. as something that is really bad that's unfolding and terrible that's happening. And so that is something that we actually have to take a disciplined effort at uh, retraining and thinking differently about. And um, this kind of doom and gloom storytelling that we consume most of the time can become therefore a self-fulfilling prophecy. And this is in the book, I spent at least a chapter and a half talking about where our attention goes, our energy flows. And so this, this you know, discipline of, of focusing on positive stories of change doesn't actually lull us into complicity, as some critics might say, but in fact motivates us to do more work. And so there's psychology around thinking that you're in a world where a story is unfolding towards better things that engages you more and for the long haul keeps you more resourced. And so the story we're living in is a major, um, a major kind of emotional ecosystem of our actions and behavior. Another example of how insights about emotion um, can help us deal with them better is the concept of risk perception theory. Um, we perceive risks in general, humans perceive risks in certain kinds of categories and risks have to take on certain types of qualities for people to really perceive them as threats. And climate change is frankly the perfect non-risk. It doesn't have, it doesn't take any of the boxes for what people are designed to think of as a problem or a threat. And so this is something that gives us a challenge for thinking about how it is that we're going to um, communicate climate change problems and why it is that people have a hard time caring about in the first place. Um, another reason emotions need to be centered to our thinking about climate change is because they matter as indicators to us. We're trained in American culture anyway, many of us, to pursue happiness and to avoid discomfort. And capitalism is quite frankly happy to oblige. We can shop or swipe and otherwise pay to have our attention taken away from all the stuff that gives us pain. And I know that I am terrible about that, right? I have a drawer full of M&Ms in here that I do deal with for that. Um, but this avoidance and denial creates actually the conditions for more harm to the environment. And so this is something that I think is really a sort of foundational concept to talk about with students about how it is that they themselves are uh, diving into forms of distraction to not come to terms with all of the incredible discomfort that they're being handed in lots of different forms. Pain is a clue to what we care about and where we should put our energies. Um, just like grief is, as some people have said, it's a form of love having no place to go. Negative emotions can help shine a light on the things that we love and that we fear that are under threat. Nobody can overhaul capitalism or save the planet single-handedly. So does that mean we just give up? The planet and our loved ones and our community and ourselves need us to be thriving and to be resourced by the work of serving each other. And so the notion that our own personal emotional well-being is central to the work of saving the planet or dealing with climate justice is something that I, I really strongly believe and argue and have come, because of my students' experience, have come to really think of as kind of my, my own personal mission uh, in, this, in this lifetime. So the third section of my talk, I just really wanna briefly um, give a little bit of an overview of the book chapters. Um, the book is organized according to strategies I researched on how to do this work. Um, I synthesize a lot of research from a wide range of fields. I tried to translate them in a digestible way, these insights from social psychology, social movement theory, and the environmental humanities. Um, the insights are things like understanding the power of story, seeing the importance of how we frame things, an analysis of how identity plays into environmental politics, how history, the arts, and power shape the current moment. These fields include affective neuroscience, trauma studies, emotional intelligence, and the science and theories of mindfulness. And of course, I look to social movements to learn how people have cultivated resilience and hope against all odds in the past. So harnessing all of this research to serve students better and to generate energy and stamina for them to carry on this work is of course, the purpose of the book. Um, one of the chapters is about hacking the story. And I'm thinking about here about um, how it is that young people in particular think of themselves as only consumers of stories. And I try in this chapter to really argue that they are in fact disseminators and producers of stories and that that work has huge political power into itself. 
Another chapter I talk a lot about the um, having students and or the audience of the book re really rethink what they think of as power and action. Many of my students are too impatient to even sit in the classroom to listen and think about these things. They want to get out and act and fix the problems. The urgency is so strong for them. And I try to have them think differently about what it means to have power. I think here about um, thinking about power with instead of power over. I think here about efficacy instead of power or agency instead of power. And similarly with action, action is really prioritized among students over things like thinking or talking or feeling for that matter. And sometimes I want to argue that action can sometimes best, the best action might be inaction. And so I really spend some time using the humanities approaches to thinking about these questions to challenge what they assume to be effective ways of acting in the world. Turns out that building community trust and supporting each other's mental health are not just um, you know, a nice byproduct of doing social movement work, but they're the engines of the movement. And I argue to my students and in the book that culture shift is the most important form of social change, not just political or legal wins. And so that's in some ways how the book is quite different than a lot of books that might talk about you know, lifestyle changes you could make to save the planet or you know, um, you know, draw down or some of the, the um, books that talk about what politics we need to change or laws that we need to change. Another chapter in the book that I really like in this moment is called Be Less Right and More in Relation. And the more I learned about the role of community trust and social capital in building resiliency against climate change, the more I got sad about the state of the divisions in this country. And so this chapter focuses on perhaps a counterintuitive argument um, that relationships and kinship and trust are actually more important to be building than other forms of infrastructure. Uh, I argue that we are going to need to meet people at the place of their fears and anger and that it may be actually harmful to us sometimes. It's not always safe or possible. But we won't be able to shift culture and become climate resilient until we A, make connections between their fears and my fears, B, we see each other as whole complex humans, and C, we recognize that the most significant barrier to environmental and racial justice is our mistrust of each other. So in the final chapter is my favorite chapter right now. It's called Feed What You Want to Grow. And I'm drawing here on Adrian Marie Brown's work and, and which is a long legacy of, of, of wisdom thinkers who are talking about things like where your mind goes, your energy flows. And um, my thinking here, and I explain it even to my kids in the gardening metaphor, the plants that we focus are sunlight and, and energy and good soil and, and um, fertilizer and water onto are the ones that will grow. And um, as a contrast to the way negative news uh, that we consume, we live in a an ecosystem of, of really terrible news. And uh, if, we, if we're putting our attention into consuming that news, that's what will grow. And in contrast, uh, I asked my students to think about, and I asked the readers of the book to think about, what is it that that grief is telling, telling you that you love and focus on that which you love? And it often involves scaling very close into the intimate and to what J. Drew Lanham has called um, the uh, intensification of the local. So um, a quick checklist, you know, you, you came for an existential toolkit. So how can we be sure we are able to do things for, the, for climate justice for the long haul? And this is COVID too. Are we personally resourced? If we are resourced, energetic, and our cups are full, we are able to weigh pros and cons rationally. Our parasympathetic nervous system has kicked in and we aren't worrying about immediate threats. Two, are we living in a story of resilience, hope, and progress? Or are we living in a story of decline, unraveling, and a Apocalypse. Three, are we constantly aware that we aren't acting alone and that we are supported and surrounded by community? This is a real contrast to the individualism of American identity, and it's not how dominant society is structured. structured. And so this takes, again, a lot of counter dominant thinking and effort to constantly think of yourself as not just part of an, just, not just an individual. And some cultures, for some cultures, this is really part of the, their DNA. For my particular Western American culture, the, count, the, the uphill battle I have to fight individualism is very, very steep. Are we visioning what we want? What kinds of collective structures of mutual support do we want instead? What does a regenerative economy look like? Where is that work happening and how can we plug into it? What do we desire about the future? And again, this is counter to fearing the future, which is the core of what's happening in America right now. This, of course, leads to a sense of victimization, powerlessness, fear of others, and even the death of democracy. Do we, have, do we feel that we have control over the conditions of our lives? If not, where can we focus? Where we do, no matter the scale. Do, our, do we see our actions as connected to a larger purpose? 
And so this is kind of a checklist that I can go through myself on kind of a daily basis that all the chapters in the book sort of lead to those directions. And I, I sort of you reframe them in the form of questions as a way to be a little bit more helpful for an audience in a talk like this. Finally, I want to just wrap up my um, time today to talk about the connections between climate anxiety and COVID and what some of these things, you know, what's my thinking might, um, how, how I might have updated the book if I had been able to publish it one month later or two months after um, COVID had really hit. The book came out in April and so we were one month into COVID when it came out. Um, psychologists have shown that people will always have a hard time caring about climate change because it doesn't fit well, as I mentioned earlier, into the schema of risk perception. That is, it doesn't take any of the forms of the things that humans tend to perceive as threats, like a scary face, right? Um, since climate change, there's my timer. Okay, that's five minutes. Good, perfect. I'm on time. Since climate change is doomed as a risk category, so there's just no way we're gonna get people to care about climate change. In fact, it's a real miracle that we care about it as much as we do. And it's entirely because of youth organizing and that's a whole different topic. Why did youth organizing finally catalyze the level of concern in the mainstream about climate change is a big question. Um, because of the work it'll take to deal with will last a lot longer than our lifetimes and also the, the long, it'll last a lot longer than any political term it's been hard to get people and politicians to care about it. And so the only way that we can mobilize concern around climate change is through its proxies, such as public health threats like COVID and also things like extreme weather events like the fires we've been having in California. And you all don't need to hear this, but climate change is happening now. It is not something that's happening in the future, which is partly, partly one of the reasons why it's been impossible to grapple with or grasp. It seems like something that we can't possibly experience. In fact, by definition, you cannot physically feel the climate changing. Um, but I think it's very important to frame it as actually happening now and that it is these other things and that we are experiencing climate change through its proxies. The existential tools that we will need to deal with climate change are the same as those that we need to deal with COVID anxiety because they are the same thing. The climate apocalypse we have been predicting is upon us in the form of COVID and many other things. Second, the research on the need for community and social capital that I talk about in my book is made so clear by this current moment, ironically at a time when we have to be isolated. And I find the irony of that um, very powerful, precisely because we have to be isolated. We are learning how much we depend on social structures, caregiving, and things like the labor of social reproduction, not just economic production, and things like human contact. The labor that goes into making the economy function is finally being revealed as essential. This is giving us a path to follow, a guide. We need to invest in a care economy. We need to rethink kinship relationships. We need to prioritize community resilience. We need to redefine ourselves as ecological selves. Third, COVID has created opportunities or a bottleneck of sorts, a sort of crisis that's opening up the opportunity to reinvent systems. And this is both scary and necessary. It is making people reassess whether it's possible to mobilize massive cultural change at all. It is making people rethink work structures and priorities, where they want to spend their money and time, whether they want to fly, whether it's necessary. It is making people rethink what a society values. The radical imagination welcoming instability as an opportunity to reinvent our world, as we can see in things like speculative fiction, for example, is being taken very seriously. And so prior to COVID, I used to talk about how important the, the radical imagination is about the future, but COVID has forced some of these things right front and center. And things like Octavia Butler's Parable of the Sower has finally made New York Times bestseller list is a kind of testament to the, the, the role of the imagination and what we're gonna be and how we're gonna face what's happening um, now and in front of us. Finally, it's not just COVID that we need to connect to in this moment with the climate movement. COVID and the climate movement, lots of people are talking about the connections there, but fewer people are talking about the movement for black lives and how it is also connected to this. This is sort of a trilogy of connections that I think is very powerful to think in concert together. Um, the Movement for Black Lives is breaking open the conversation of how any organization, environmental or, other not, other, or otherwise, perpetuates oppression. We should make sure that we are constantly drawing connections between these three things, because single-issue politics, a lot like the siloing of academic disciplines, ignores the system that connects these things. 
and the many ways that we can build coalitions. And so I think of the COVID, M4BL, and climate kind of trilogy of things um, being exemplary of why it is it's very important to do interdisciplinary work and to think it's the same thing as manifesting in politics. And um, we see this all over our campuses and on the streets in protests, that the connections between these things, the more they're drawn out, the more effective the movements can be and also the problems, innovative problem solving that comes out of um, higher education. So the, the phrase, I can't breathe, is about police brutality, yes. It's also about environmental racism that cites air pollution in black and brown neighborhoods. And it's also about the connected disproportionate vulnerability of black and brown bodies to COVID and also their uneven access to medical care. So we've never seen a moment so clearly as this to bring the movements of climate, medical justice and racial justice together to reject the logic of disposability that benefits a small group of people on the planet. And all of the affective and emotional and um, sort of um, movement-based work that I'm talking about in my book really draws on long legacies of um, civil rights, fe the feminist movement, uh, American Indian movement, and various other social movements that are really um, enabling and supporting the climate movement to think about how to bring these worlds together. And much of that is around um, affective and emotional and existential tools that I try to, to talk about in my book. So that's my, that's my talk, and I'm excited to, to carry on this conversation. Obviously, I could talk about this all day, so I'm just going <laughs> to Thank you so much, uh, Professor Ray. That, that was a really engaging presentation, and uh, we already have some questions showing up in the Q&A, but folks, if you would like to um, uh, add more questions, that's fine. Um, I guess I'd, I'd like to start um, first by thanking you for a few things your your discussion of the uh, significance of land acknowledgements i think is really really salient and important and um, certainly something i'd like for us to think about as an institution when we use a land acknowledgement um, how do we make that meaningful uh, so thank you uh, for modeling that for us um, second thing in your um, the title of your talk, you talk about the climate generation and now in the COVID generation as well. I'm, I'm curious if you could just define that a little bit. How do you understand that? Oh, you're muted, I think. I always laugh there we go. when they do that. Now I did it. Sorry. <laughs> it's classic. I'm so sorry. Okay. So uh, the climate generation is something that I, um, I started to think about because I've been teaching environmental studies for five years before something shifted. And the shift really made me think something different was happening with this group of students. Um, and it wasn't just the, the environment we were living in being crazier. It was also something, you know, it was both. It was both the sort of new demographic happening and also something happening outside in the world. And so I really started with that puzzle. That was my first question. What's, what's happening in these two places? And um, in looking at the generation itself, if we think about Generation Z and kind of late millennials as the climate generation, we're talking about people born after 1996. And um, this is just a really unique, interesting generation. And as I researched it more, I became sort of fascinated by what, this, what was coming in my classroom. And I thought, <laughs> professors really ought to be paying more attention to what's happening with these, with these people, right? That, they're, that there's, there's new things happening, right? They have a different relationship with media. They have a different relationship with each other. They have a different relationship with things like you know, school shootings and, um, you know, they're, they're post 9-11. So some folks have called them the, the, the massacre generation or some folks have called them the risk generation. And so there's all these sort of generalizations that may or may not be helpful, including the climate generation or the COVID generation. But the key things that kind of draw them together, in my view, in my research, is that they are the first generation that will be the, the they will, their lifespans are actually going to be the sh shorter than their parents. So the first generation who will live less long than their parents. And that's kind of a really depressing fact. Um, and that's partly to do with climate, but that's a lot of other things. This is also the most diverse generation that America will ever see. It's also the biggest generation that the U.S. will ever see. So the size and the sort of demographic span of the generation, I find super fascinating. It raises all kinds of questions about where we're going. 
Um, the fact is that this generation overwhelmingly, even across political divides, there's a bipartisan agreement among this generation that climate change is a significant problem. And so unlike the stories that we hear in mainstream culture, that climate change and science is something that only liberals care about and, and Republicans don't care about it, the next generation is going to force a rethinking of, of how we make these divisions. And if we paid more attention to this, we might actually go faster on climate change. If we paid more attention to how young people feel about climate change and also racial justice, we would move more quickly. Um, so I really, I sort of think of them as teaching us, as pushing us to, to do this stuff better. Um, they're also bringing the, the racial justice questions to the forefront of climate change, and the climate movement has been unable to do that thus far. So to watch the young, to watch youth take over the climate movement, as we've seen in the last few years, has actually been the cause of the redefining of the movement for racial justice. And all of these intersectionality between environmental and social problems is because of young people's movement. It used to be that um, students would come into my classroom and their biggest, their biggest sadness is when they realize that there's no such thing as wilderness anymore, right? You teach them, you know, Cronin's The Trouble with Wilderness or something, or Jake Kozak or Mark Spence, and you, they think, oh my gosh, Yosemite is not wonderful. It's all this history of oppression and genocide. And now we have students who, first of all, that is their legacy. They already know this. Most young people are coming to the classroom knowing that. And now they are saying, Humanity is actually not the problem, they're the, the sort of solution to the problem, right? So there's all of the battles that I used to fight around trying what, what mattered to students, what to teach students, whether or not the humanities mattered, whether or not there was such a thing as, you know, non-science ways of addressing environmental problems. Young people know that, they already have that down. So they already have all the, this, this in sight. And so they're, they're redefining the movement in new ways. They also have a lot of things going on that's so super depressing, like they're, Levels of isolation, suicide, and depression and anxiety are 40% or something more than they were 10 years ago. I mean, I, I'm not citing exact data, but I do in my book. The, the increase of, of depression, anxiety, and um, suicide and loneliness in this generation is really alarming. And what I'm asking for is, can we talk about this in terms of the environmental context of this? Because we don't, there's no, climate anxiety is not in the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistic Manual. You know, we don't have language for this among professionals. I don't think that my counseling and psychology, psychology services office on campus is thinking about climate anxiety. So there's not, students are not really getting the language to connect what's happening around the world with what's happening with them. And that just perpetuates yet another kind of you know, um, locating the problem in the individual and not looking at the structural problems, which is so chronic in our society anyway. And also this generation is the most, the least likely to vote of any generation. And so you have a real um, set of both opportunities and, and, you know, what do they call SWOT analysis? You have strengths and opportunities with this generation that are super interesting. And I just look forward to seeing how they all, it all plays out as they start to take, you know, start to see themselves in roles of leadership. And my book is really about trying to make sure that happens because I think that the despair and the lack of tools around what's happening with them, I mean, their, their despair is palpable. Anybody who's an educator of these issues can feel it. It's heavy in the class and it's heavy. It's heavy. I mean, the COVID is just amped it up to 11. And um, if we don't have the, if we can't figure out with our, you know, adept ability to research these tools and re refigure our, our teaching strategies to take their emotional lives seriously. Um, and I'm not talking about becoming therapists. I'm talking about integrating their emotional, you know, the science is out on how emotions are necessary for students to learn our material. So that's just the premise, the beginning of it. We have an emotional hidden curriculum to all of our syllabi anyway. And so we might as well be more transparent about it. You know, what, are, what is the outcome we would, we would hope them to have? And how do our assignments and our readings and the way we talk about things in class, how does that build that emotional outcome we want? I mean, as a very basic step. Well, um, there's a, a student question that I think um, connects with a lot of what you're saying here. Um, so I'll read this. Can you see us reaching climate justice in our generation? Do you believe the youth of today have the tools available to make the changes needed to reach climate justice? If not, how can we make those tools available and make people care about climate change? And so I know, um, you know, these are definitely things you address in the book, but I wonder if there's um, something there. I bet the student, really I mean, that's a student writing the question, but I bet the student has a better answer than I do. 
<laughs> um, and that's like four questions wrapped into one. So I'll try to. Yeah, that. exactly. Yeah, right. But they're all great questions. And the, the reason why I say that is because I would love to talk about all of them. Um, but the question is, so young people have more tools than they think they have. And that's part of the argument I write in my book. I think that it benefits the powers that be, and there's a lot of people who theorize this, it benefits the powers that be for us to not feel like we have any power. And young people, for the most part, have believed that. And I have believed that. It's taken untraining for me to get past that. Um, and so the, the first thing that we, you know, I try to do in my classes is to think about what power students already have and rethink power as a positive thing, not a negative thing. You know, there's so much sense of powerlessness um, and we, we start there. So what powers you already have? Uh, we do something called asset mapping to do that. There's all kinds of tools you can think about to do that. And so, yes, young people have already a lot of tools. Also, as I mentioned, they are bringing things to the conversation and they're changing the movement in ways that um, the movement has failed to change, in part because of their youth. And I'm thinking here of the youth climate movement and why they've been so effective in ways that the climate movement has not been able to be. And I think that there, this is something having to do with the ways that especially Western culture perceives childhood and perceives young people as kind of morally superior and having them um, sort of a purity around them that, um, you know, some people have argued that the only way you can get baby boomers to care about the climate is to talk about their grandchildren. And so there's a sense of obligation to young people or a sense of not wanting to have young people go through a loss of innocence or, you know, there's sort of all kinds of uh, ways that I think mainstream culture pays attention to young people and they have a rhetorical position that other people don't have. And so that's a power young people will always have unless that changes. <laughs> so that's exciting to think about. Um, so they're bringing in a different type of analysis. They have a different rhetorical position to make the arguments and they also bring in a lot of strengths um, that, that our gener my generation doesn't have. And can, will they see climate justice in their lifetime? You know, this is this something I think about a lot in my book. I, I, I won't go too much into it, but I spent a lot of time thinking about and writing about whether or not we need to see the outcomes of our efforts in order to justify engaging in them. And um, will we see climate justice? Maybe, maybe not. You know, we'll certainly see progress towards it, and we'll also see a lot of progress away from it. You know, and my argument is we have to find some other reason to get engaged in the work other than seeing the outcomes of our efforts. And this is something that Martin Luther King Jr.'s talked about, Gandhi's talked about, Mandela's talked about, you know, Rebecca Solna is one of my favorite um, thinkers on this. There, there is no, um, there's not going to be any end to the revolution. And so this is an argument for manifesting the, the world you want to live in, in your right now. And so one of the reasons why I think young people are very quick to burn out, and that's another thing I write about, I have a chapter on burnout in my book, is that they, they think that they're the first to have engaged in a massive compelling you know, mission and movement, and they're willing to fire themselves out um, doing that work. And the work is the long haul. Robert Bullard calls this the marathon, not the sprint. And if we think about there, we're doing this in concert with a lot of people that we need to be able to do it for the long haul and we need to be able to do it even when we see no results or even when we do see results. We, we, you know, we, we see results in this election. Does that stop us doing what we're doing? Mm. Not at all. Um, so the results are not the point. And I think I think I don't want to, I could go on forever about that because I have a whole analysis of hope and the, you know, what, what the role of hope is in the book and that kind of thing. But I, that's just a great question and I could, I could talk yeah. about it. <laughs> One of my favorite lines from Wendell Berry is, hope lives in the means, not the ends. And he has a brilliant reflection on that. Um, so a, a lot of what you're talking about is about building an infrastructure kind of on a really local level, like in our face-to-face our -face communities maybe, but perhaps through digital communities, I don't know, to support cultural change. Um, I, you know, our economy, and the dominant forms of entertainment and infotainment really tend to keep us tied up, like we're so busy, right? And um, I wonder how we convince ourselves that we actually have time and energy to do the work of, of building that infrastructure. I mean, you talked about the, you know, the relationships as an infrastructure being maybe more important than what we usually think of as infrastructure. Can you say a little bit about that? Yeah, are you asking more about how do we get ourselves off of 
things that waste our time? Or are you get asking about? Um, well, you know, we maybe um, we might seek for, to to meet some needs, um, even just for like relaxation, or maybe it's distraction. Mm. But ultimately, they're not getting us anywhere. Um, yeah. I, you know, people do feel really, really busy and really stressed out. Um, and therefore maybe unable to do the work of, of building those relationships. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that that is, um, that's how many people feel. And I am fortunate to have a job that that's sort of my job to think about. So yeah. it's easy for me to say, right. Um, you know, my job is to think about how, how best to, you know, plug in and do this work and I can define my research and my teaching around those topics. So that's a real privilege of mine. Um, but I think when I think about my students who are often in that same boat, right, they often are holding three or four jobs, none of which look like their major, none of which seem to have anything to do with the things that they care the most about. Um, you know, where are they doing it and how are they doing it? And I think this is where um, the chapter on, the ch there's a chapter in the book called um, Claim Your Calling and Scale Your Action. And that chapter seems to be the one that my students like the most of all the chapters, in part because what it does is it says, the scale of the work you do is not what's relevant, right? And it has to do with where you put in your intention and attention in, on a daily basis. And this is where I get a little bit, um, I get a little bit Buddhist, you know? And I think about how it is that your daily attention, sort of like the way Annie Dillard says, the way you spend your day is the way you spend your life, or Adrian Marie Brown talks about it in terms of the ocean and a drop, and um, the thinking of the microscopic or the granular as part of the large, this, this is really important, I think, for thinking about, okay, so that I don't have to have, I, th I think we get overwhelmed with the scale of the problem and how long it's gonna take to fix it, and we just give up. And that goes to the child in the pond scenario I was talking about earlier. And if we think about, if we try to break down, and this is where the work, to, where I do in my classes is, right? Break down, okay, what is it that you wanna see? What's that vision of the future that you want? And the, your topic of your, um, of your of your conference is re, you know imagining an ecological future right and so I opened my book with the story of my students not being able to imagine a future but if they can't imagine a future that they desire that they're trying to work towards then of course they're going to fill their time with you know social cho choices and media choices and all kinds of different choices of how they're spending their time that aren't built building up towards that end game. And so I think about the work it takes with students to backward design their goals. And so they break down the larger stuff into actual bite-sized bits that they can actually do. The very next most elegant step is something we talk about all the time. What's the next elegant step you can take? And that, that for one student I write in my book was through 30 days of mindfulness. She printed out a 30 days of mindfulness thing so that she could just kind of get herself collected to even begin to think about what her priorities were and where she was going to devote her energy. And I, and at first I thought that was not that she wasn't doing the assignment right. You know, like I was like, no, that's not action. No, that's that's just navel gazing, right? That's just that's small potatoes, you know. Um, but I more and more I thought about it, and the more I did my had to do my own work like that on myself, the more I realized that that was that was the scale and that sort of mentioned I mentioned it in my talk you know we look around at the place that we can control and we work slowly on those places that we can control and that is it creates a feedback loop of efficacy that makes us do more it introduces us to other people doing the work I think the highlight of my time as a teacher is when I see students their social lives start in, in freshman year as quite separate from their academic lives and over time in their couple of years that they're here, their social lives and their academic lives fuse. And that's when you really have achieved what I'm talking about, right? That their, their intention and attention are aligned. They're getting community and networking to build the kind of work that they wanna do. They're surrounding themselves and people who are also doing that kind of work and inspiring them and fueling them. And you know, going back to this argument I made earlier, the community, the sense of community and sense of collectivity in the, what they're doing is the, most important thing. And so before you think about overturning capitalism, instead ask yourself, how can I feel connected to people who care about this stuff with me? That is the first, that is the lifeline I would say is the first thing to do. There's a, there's a question kind of related to this and you are just on the edge of answering it without being asked, uh, Sarah, but can you say more about the occasional effectiveness of inaction and maybe the, the mindfulness exercises would be one. 
maybe with an example. Um, I find this fascinating and often overlooked strategy or even a necessity. Yeah, so maybe just a, another quick example oh, I love of, it. of inaction. I love it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm, I am thinking here about kind of countering dominant forms of power that we see in society that there are certain kinds of spectacular forms of action and social change that we think of when we think of how do you change society, right? It's in our movies, it's in our politics, it's in our public discourse, it's in our TV. And I, my provocation to students is to, is what if those things were all not true? What else is possible? What other forms of change can happen? Where else is change happening that we just aren't seeing in the, in, framed in this way? What's non-spectacular? You know, how did they even get there? When we see evidence of social change, can we trace back all of the weird amorphous things that got us there? Um, so there's, there is a, um, you know, there's a kind of critical thinking dimension of this. You know, what do we even define as action? And can inaction ever be in action? Is something that I definitely am basing on kind of both feminist and also Eastern philosophy in thinking about how, you know, emptiness as a kind of fullness um, and that there's um, especially in this in this sort of moment our inability to if we can resist um, jumping in and taking the most impulsive action based on what's firing in our amygdala in the moment when we're dysregulated that's that kind of action is really privileged and prioritized and really valued right now in Dhamma discourse. And my suggestion is, for example, this is not the only way, but my suggestion is that inaction is a form of figuring out how to deal with the emotional response you're having to a situation before you figure out what the right action is to take. And so that's why I say to my students, no, don't get impatient about getting out of your seats. You don't want to go out there and waste your energy in directions that are in fact counterproductive or may not be in, in line with your real mission. You know, if you were to backward design from your real mission, are you putting your energy in the right direction or are you just responding to the, the nearest, you know, chaos that's in front of you? And so the inaction I'm suggesting there has to do with the thinking work it takes to figure out what your end game is and what your um, next step will then be. And that just takes sometimes sitting still. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So, you know, thinking um, and self-care and so forth, these are actually actions. So when you say inaction, you're, you're talking about the stuff that's really visible, getting up and moving yeah. around. And I'm, I'm being provocative there. I'm, I'm sort sure. of using yeah. the assumptions around action against itself. Right? We, we just have a couple minutes left. Um, so this question is totally unfair to ask, but I'm going to read the question and maybe just give you a way to, or a thought about answering it quickly. So, and I apologize to all the folks who asked questions that we, we didn't get to, but can you give a, a summary of um, the colonialist theory of the origin of the uh, climate crisis? So the idea that this is um, a manifestation of, of colonization. Yeah. And I'm curious, um, how does understanding that, how do you think that understanding that could help us out. So in other words, this isn't just capitalism or industrialism. It goes even maybe a few centuries deeper than that. I have, How does I, that there's help so us many out? Ways, I would love to hear other people's thoughts on this too, and it's too bad I can't, but I have so many, there's, this is a, it's too long of an answer, it's true. But for one, when we think about industrialization or capitalism as the root cause of our problem, or something like overpopulation, which has been an argument in the past too, that is now, you know, thanks to a lot of um, feminists and third world feminists has been <laughs> rejected and thank goodness the Malthusian implications there. But, um, you know, thinking about capitalism as a problem sets us up to think that, th that capitalism can't be a solution. So that's one thing, right? Can, can capitalists be a solution? Can it be a bridge to some solutions? We're seeing that happen. And I, I do frankly, personally feel like that's really important. So I don't particularly wanna, you know, hang capitalism, you know, out to dry sure. and also, what happens is when we think about capitalism as the problem or we think about humanity as the problem, all of that ignores the different ways that indigenous people have actually lived in ways that have been sometimes not great with nature, but a lot of times really great with nature. And so um, the kind of indigenous worldviews that may actually be, you know, uh, can coexist with capitaliz capitalism or industrialization get kind of um, thrown out if we don't actually acknowledge this as something that's rooted in colonialism. And so, you know, I'm thinking here of Kyle Palace White's great work on urgency and the climate crisis is something that has been going on, um, you know, for over 400 years and climate disruption is something that, you know, is not a new thing and any 
people who say, oh no, we're having this moment, capitalism has run amok, humanity has run amok, is a form of erasure of that, all those forms of genocide. And so I, I guess my point is, first of all, we want to acknowledge that, that this, this disruption has been happening to lots of communities, people for a long time, and that colonialism itself is a different apparatus than capitalism. And it, they meld together in some pretty insidious ways, but to attack colonialism um, first is a different, it would be, require different strategies than to attack capitalism. And I think when we have, we have a lot of times when I mentioned in my, my own opening, when indigenous interests are actually um, antagonistic to what the mainstream climate movement might want. And so the climate movement has, has a bad tendency of um, acting against indigenous interests because it doesn't acknowledge this history of colonialism and the climate. So, you know, I'm thinking about trying to build these bridges between indigenous sovereignty and the climate movement more effectively um, when I'm thinking about that kind of origin story. If we think about colonialism as more of a, an origin story, it, it, re it results in different actions, different strategies. Yeah, there's a rich inquiry to be had there. Thank you yeah. uh, for that comment I, or for that further explanation. Um, uh, Dean Chuck Ryback um, put something in the Q&A that isn't a question, it's more of a comment. Um, it says, just a quick note from a very grateful Dean, this is one of the best, most important talks I've ever heard. Our college's community cannot thank you enough. Um, so, um, very yeah, sweet. so, I think we should wrap up there. And I know there are a few more questions, but I can say to everybody out there that um, Professor Ray's book is very accessible. It's very, um, it's, you know, it's a really interesting and engaging book to read. And so I do encourage you to check it out. It really does get into the, um, those, the strategies, the toolkit, the toolbox um, practices and so forth. Uh, that some of you have asked about. So uh, really uh, could be a wonderful thing for you to check out. Um, thank you so much, Professor Ray, for being with us this evening here, late afternoon there. Uh, and Sunset. thanks everybody for joining us. Yeah, <laughs> like I said, black is pitch here in Wisconsin as of about two hours ago. Um, but um, I want to let everybody know that we still have uh, a number of events coming up in the in the conference tomorrow. There are four live virtual events. You can go to uh, causeeffect.org um, and check those out. I don't know if Amanda or Ryan, if you can paste that link in real quick um, to the event schedule uh, to share. I'm not quite sure how we would do that, but it's C A H S S effect.org and then you can go to the events page but if you found this talk you can probably find that right uh, and there are also going to be a lot of virtual exhibits uh, shared there so you can um, check out student and faculty work and performances um, there on the causeeffect.org website uh, so thank you again professor ray thanks everybody for coming and hope you all have a good evening thank you so much